I would invite you to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, Gospel of John. Let us read in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In honor to the word of God, will you please stand as we read. John 1, 1 through 4. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He, that is Jesus, was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Let us pray. Dear Lord, these and other verses today are precious as we think about them, and we pray that you will guide us. I also want to add to our prayers that we've had this morning, Laura and her family, and some of the grief that they've had, that you will Strengthen them and bless them and give them your encouragement. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. We are uh, talking about knowing God in a series that we have had now for a number of weeks. Today we're going to be talking about our living God. Thankfully, we serve a living God. He's not like uh, some other gods who are just wood and stone and other gods who have died and are worshiped, people that are worshiped, but our God is a living God. He's alive today. And today we're going to be talking about our God being self-existent. That is, he exists just by the fact of his being God. And I believe there are five Bible facts that will declare this truth. Number one, God possesses life in and of himself. The key verse in the verses that we read this morning is verse four. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. This is just part of who God is. He is life. He possesses life of his own. Sometimes children will ask the question, where did God come from? And sometimes we as adults ask that question too. Where did God come from? And the answer is, he has always existed. Another question is, who created God? And the answer is, no one created God. God has always existed. He has never had a beginning. And there was no one who ever created him. If someone would have created God, that someone would be greater than God and then would be God. So the only answer to the question is that God is God, and he is above all. And he's always existed. He's always had life. Our God is ever living. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That is, Jesus was with God in the beginning. And all things were made through him. Nothing was made except through him. In him was life. In Christ was life. In God was life. Life is a part of God's nature. No one brought God into existence. No one else and nothing else has existed before God. The only thing that existed before God created the universe was God. He has always existed. Only God existed on his own. God said to Moses, as you remember at the burning bush, that incident is recorded back in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses was out in the desert, he had been driven into the desert because of the Pharaoh planning to kill him. And so there, as he was tending the sheep, he had been doing that for about 40 years, he saw a burning bush. You remember that he saw that bush just kept burning and burning and it wasn't consumed, so he walked close to it. And there was a voice that came out of the bush. You're standing on holy ground, take off your shoes. And then as the voice told him that he was to go to Egypt to speak to the Pharaoh and to ask Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go 
and to command them in the name of God to let them go. He said, well, who shall I say sent me? What authority do I have? The answer came from God, from the voice of the early bush. I am that I am. That is my name. And that's what you are to tell the Pharaoh. I am that I am. What does that mean? That means that God has always existed. That he is currently alive and that he always will be alive. We serve a living God. That's great news, isn't it? Not only is God the Father living, but his son Jesus is part of that. As we read in John chapter 1, further along in John chapter 8, Jesus is encountering some of the leaders of the Jewish people. And this is how it goes. The Jews said to him, this is verse 52 of John 8, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? and the prophets are dead, who do you make yourself out to be? That's quite a question that is being asked of Jesus. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. That's Jesus talking about seeing Abraham way almost 2,000 years before this event. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He took God's name, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. What an amazing statement the Lord made. Before Abraham was, I am. Throughout the Bible, from the Old Testament throughout the New Testament, God consistently declares his self-existence. He uses the name I am. Jesus uses that expression many times in the Gospel of John. Probably the one that stands out the most to us is, I am the resurrection and the life. Also, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When we get to the book of Revelation, the last book in the New Testament, once again we see this claim for the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, verse 8, as the Apostle John is receiving the vision, he, he sees this from the Lord, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That's quite a statement by the Lord. The beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. This is the first and last part of the Greek alphabet. It's just from beginning to end. I am the Lord. Then in verse 11, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, you write in the book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. This is a word from the Lord Jesus Christ to the Apostle John. Then in verses 17 and 18, And when I saw him, this is John, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. As we said, this theme goes, out, goes throughout the Bible, from the book of Genesis all the way through Revelation. In the last chapter of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 13, this is what the Lord says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. What is the Lord saying? He is saying, I am existing on my own. No one has ever created me. I am always able to give life. I am the living God. Back in the Old Testament, Isaiah is one of the prophets that writes very much about this. In chapter 48 of Isaiah, we read in verses 12 and 13, Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel my called. I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth. 
and my right hand is stretched out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand up together. God is talking about his creation here. I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. God owes his existence to no one. No one ever created God. God has always existed. But do we owe our creation to someone? Yes. We haven't always existed, have we? No human being has always existed. We have come into this world because of God's creative power in which he created humanity and allowed humanity to procreate. But there was a beginning. God created us. So we have learned that God had no one to create him, no beginning. The second thing is the universe owes its existence to God. The entire universe owes its existence to God. Everything in the universe had a beginning. Genesis 1.1, the first verse in the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was a beginning for everything that we see, everything that we know about. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, night unto night shows knowledge. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout the entire earth and to the ends of the world. What is being said here is the evidence of God's creation is everywhere. Throughout the world, everyone can see it. There's a creator. Romans 1.20 is a very important verse because it tells us how significant it is for us to understand that Jesus and God are the creator. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That's a warning, and it's a sad word, but it's a good word, too, because it says that everywhere there's evidence that God is a creator. And there's no excuse for not understanding there's a God. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. So what is being said here is that there's evidence that the universe owes its existence to God. He is the owner of everything. We read in Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. We read in Psalm chapter 50, verses 5 through 7, that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine, all of the resources in the world, God owns them. He put them there. God is the owner of everything that exists in our world, and it's a wonderful world. Back in the book of Genesis, there was the account of Abraham coming back from a battle in which he had defeated a number of kings that had ransacked the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, where his son-in-law Lot lived. And when he came back, he was met by an unusual person named Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a priest from Salem or Jerusalem. It says in the book of Hebrews that he had no beginning and no end. There's no family lineage. It sounds like Melchizedek might have been Christ appearing in the Old Testament, which I believe it was true. But he's only identified as Melchizedek. But Melchizedek says this, Blessed be Abraham and the God of Abraham, the Most High, who is the possessor of heaven and earth. Right there, way back in Genesis chapter 14, God was proclaimed as a possessor of heaven and earth. So what do you think God was doing before he created everything? Was he bored? <laughs> Did he have anything to do since he existed and lived forever? Sometimes we wonder about that. But God was never bored. And it's going to be great in heaven to ask a lot of questions of the Lord. Is One thing we ask is, what were you doing, Lord, before you created everything? Because you have always existed. And God will have an answer for us. God is never lonely, although he created us to have companionship and fellowship with him. He created us to glorify him, to bring honor to him in a way that nothing else could bring honor to him. 
There's a great uh, verse in Genesis 1.26 where it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image. That means that God had companionship already, didn't he? Let us. Who's he talking to? He's talking to himself. He's talking to the Holy Spirit. He's talking to Jesus, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our own image. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That's significant. Male and female, he created them. That has always been the case. Even today, it's the case, isn't it? Procreation is male and female, just as God has designed it in the very beginning. And it was so beautiful, so spectacular, that God gave Adam and Eve this beautiful garden to live in, just as he created the entire world for us to enjoy. Number three, we're talking about God as always having his own existence. God is accountable only to himself. He's not accountable to anybody else. All of us are accountable to somebody, but not God. He's only accountable to himself. There are a number of passages in Isaiah that I'd like to just have us walk through some of these verses in Isaiah, starting with chapter 40, verses 12 through 18. If you'd like to look it up and follow your Bible or else just listen as I read. Starting in chapter 40, verse 12. Who measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? It is God. God measured heaven with a span and calculated the gusts of the earth, dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor taught him? Who taught God? With whom did he take counsel and who instructed him? Who taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Well, the answer is no one. Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing. Verse 17, all nations before him are as nothing and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. We kind of get worried about nuclear war, don't we? What's going on in our world today? God says, don't worry, I have it under control. And even if the world should be destroyed in so many ways, I'm still God, and I have a place for you, I have a future for you. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare to him? God is incomparable. Over in chapter 42, starting with verse 5, Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people. Isn't God too busy to hold our hand? He created the universe. He has to keep everything going. But he promises to be with us and to bring us through to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. So often we read about how God does not want anything else to come before him in our worship. Chapter 44, verse 6 of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Now, God is talking about himself. Does it sound like he's being a little arrogant to claim all this? Well, he has a right to claim it because it's true. He is God and there is no other. And if we honor him, he will honor us. Chapter 45 beginning with verse 5. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me. And as Isaiah was getting this message from God, he must have been just thrilled and amazed. You are communicating with me. You're the Lord. I'm a human being, and you're telling me all these things about yourself, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. 
I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. Rain down you heavens from above, and let the skies pour forth righteousness. Let the earth open, let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. To chapter 46. It's just amazing how we're, we're missing some, skipping some of the things that, that Isaiah said because it's also wonderful. Beginning with verse 9. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. It is so amazing to read all of these things about God. So who is God accountable to? Only himself. No one else. God is responsible to himself. He is self-existent, self-dependent, self-sufficient, but we are accountable to God. Romans 14.12 says, So then each one of us must give account of himself to God. Hebrews 9.27, It is appointed unto people once to die and after that the judgment, when God will take an account of us. Why is this the case? Because God has given us a beautiful world. He's given us life. Life that only he could give because he is the author of life. He is life himself. And because he has given us life, he has asked us to live to glorify him and we are accountable to that. How are we going to live our life? Are we going to fill it with all kinds of selfish things? I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to get this. I want to get that. Or do we want to actually really glorify God? Do we really want to do that? God says, if you do that, the blessings for you will be beyond your understanding. God says, honor me and I will honor you. So when we are disgruntled, complaining, discouraged, God wants us to be thankful. He wants us to be joyful. He wants to think of all the blessings that he's given us. Our attitude is so significant. Yesterday, Georgia and I had the privilege of visiting Lois Larson, and some of you may remember Lois. She hasn't been able to be in church for a long time because she's been at the Shalom House, and we've had COVID and all these things, but through it all, Lois has been saved. And as we were visiting her room, it's just a cozy room. She's got all kinds of pictures of family. She's got, I think, almost 30 grandchildren and over 50 great-grandchildren. She started out with eight children of her own, and that just grew into this kind of a family tree. And then she was showing us her list of names that she prays for every day, all these family members. And, and we're on that list. Isn't that amazing? Bethel Baptist Church is on that list. And so we were talking to Lois, and she is sharp as a tack, 94 years old. But she is a, very much in tune with what's going on in the world, in her family, in the church, and her relationship with God. What an inspiration to see a person like that. And she's making all kinds of little knickknacks that she has everywhere a creative person because God has filled her life with joy and she has that joy that she can give to others. God says we must give account of ourselves to him. Someday we'll be at the judgment seat of Christ. And what have we done with the gift of life? What have we done with the purpose God has for us? God says I have given you this day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Rejoice today. Be glad tomorrow. Sadness comes. Grief comes. Challenges come. God says weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. But in our hearts, we know that God is taking care of us. We know that no matter what happens, we will be with God someday. So we live with a purpose. Colossians 3 says, If you then be risen with Christ, Seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. 
That's a great promise. It's a promise by the one who said, I am. Number four, we're giving five major points about God's self-existence. Number four, God is never tired. Human beings get tired. Do you ever feel like taking a nap? Don't do it right now, though. <laughs> Try to stay awake. Sometimes we just want to go lay down, or sometimes we fall asleep. Actually, sometimes I'll fall asleep when I'm supposed to be awake watching something or listening to something. But God is never tired. He never needs sleep. These great verses come to us from Isaiah chapter 40, starting with verse 25. To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their hosts by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. Neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Psalm 121 says, He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Behold, the Lord is a sun and a shield. Stuart Hamblin wrote the song, This old house is getting shaky, this old house is getting old. This old house lets in the rain, this old house lets in the cold. He's talking about us as human beings. He says, ain't you gonna need this house no longer? Ain't you gonna need this house no more? I got time to fix the shingles, time to fix the floor. He's talking about this house wears down, but there's a better house. And that house is heaven, where God is. God is never tired. Number five, God cherishes human life and our salvation. Remember how we started this out in John chapter 1, verse 4? In him is life. Life comes from God. God cherishes life. He gave us the greatest thing we could have, life. When does life start? It starts when God puts that little seed into a mother's womb. That seed is the beginning of life. In him was life, and he gives life to us as human beings. John 10, 10, I am come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, God is speaking to Jeremiah, and he says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. God has a plan for us, as we read in Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to bless you, not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. In Acts 17, Paul is speaking to the Areopagus on Mars Hills. And he talks about life. And he says, the unknown God is the God I'm going to tell you about. And he says, in him we live and move and have our existence. That's the God of heaven. In Hebrews chapter 7, it says that this God, this Savior, this Lord, ever lives. He's alive. Ever lives to make intercession for us. So when we pray... God is not sleeping. He's awake. Jesus hears our prayers, and he makes intercession for us. Isn't it good to know that there's not a single thing that God misses? We as people are created by an uncreated God. We are in good hands. We're in the best possible hands, God's hands. We've talked a little bit about creation today and some of the other things, and I'd like to share a few facts that I've looked up. The amazing thing about the creation that we live in 
and the planet that we have, the planet Earth, there are many variables necessary to make life on this planet possible. The conditions have to be just perfect on this planet for it to exist and for us to have life and for, us to, for this planet to support life. And now science has even concluded that there's probably another single planet in the entire universe that has just the right conditions like Earth does to have life. If you remember for a long time, people were saying, well, there's got to be life on other planets, other places. But according to science now, they say there's just too many variables. Everything has to be just perfect for life to exist. And one of the variables is the size. And these are just a few things. There are actually thousands of variables. Everything just has to work just perfectly in order for us to be in a place where we can have life. And these are just a few things, the size of the Earth. Our planet is just the right size. It doesn't have too much gravity or too little gravity. If it had too much gravity, all of the things that would uh, be harmful to us, like methane and ammonia, would be close to the ground, and they'd be with us, and we, we couldn't survive. If it had too little gravity, then all of our oxygen would, be, would go away. The gravity level is just exactly, precisely the way it's supposed to be. Another area is water. We need water. 75% of our bodies are water. And we need water in order to live. We need water in order to have a world. And the water is just exactly the proportion that it's supposed to be. And one of the things that was fascinating to me is the fact that ice floats because something that is solid is supposed to be heavier than something that is liquid. Why does ice float? Well, this is what happens. Water does not does become more dense as it cools until it hits 39.2 degrees. Why that number, 39.2 degrees? God decided that. At which point it becomes less dense. And then it becomes less dense so that it can float. Ice, water, can float on water because it's less dense, starting at 39.2 degrees. And if it did not have this ability, lakes would freeze from the bottom up and everything would be frozen. There wouldn't be any marine life or anything else. But because of this particular little feature that God planned, it works out just the way it's supposed to work. And another thing is the speed of the Earth. As you know, we're rotating, going around and around. And how long does it take to go around one complete time? Well, it's exactly 24 hours, isn't it? That's why we have day and night, because the Earth is rotating. And we see the sun part of the time and it's dark part of the time. Now, if it wasn't exactly 24 hours, it would be hard to have life. If it was 30 hours one direction, 30 hours the other, it would, be, it would get too cold at times and it would get too hot at times. We couldn't survive. Why is it exactly 24 hours that the Earth rotates? Well, because God decided that would be, be the right time. Just a little thing, but a very important thing. So the, the speed, and the Earth, as you know, is traveling at a tremendous speed as it goes along. Another thing is the miracle of the moon. The moon is so crucial to us, 240,000 miles away from the Earth, just the right distance from the Earth. And it's the, the gravitational pull of the, Earth, of the moon makes it possible for us to have the tides for the oceans, which cleanses everything and makes it possible to have uh, the kind of conditions that we have. If the, if the moon were too far away, the tides would be too great. And it would be, if it was too close, it would be the opposite. So all of these things work out together. God has everything planned. And everything is just in the right distance. Another thing is the, the planet Jupiter. Jupiter is the largest of the planets. And because it's 318 times the size of the sun, uh, size of the Earth, rather, it absorbs all of the uh, different little planets uh, uh, that are coming along 
and they aren't bombarding the Earth. They're getting absorbed by Jupiter. And the, the right size of Jupiter helps to, to balance the gravitational pull as all the planets. We need every single planet so that everything will rotate just right. That's kind of mind-boggling. It makes, makes me dizzy thinking of it. But that's just a few of thousands of little variables that are necessary for us to have life on this planet. Who decided all that? God did. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And one of the fascinating things that I was reading about is uh, the beauty of our country is amazing, too. Some of you have been to California, have seen this, but I haven't. The redwood trees. Have any of you seen that? I guess the redwood trees are something else. Uh, some of the tallest ones are almost 400 feet high. That's a high tree. And they're hundreds of years old, and the, the trunk is so big that you can cut, cut a groove through it and drive a truck through the middle of, the truck, of that tree. That's one of God's amazing creations. He's made a beautiful world. But think of this. John said in chapter 21 of Revelation, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and God shall dwell with them. And God himself shall be with them, and God shall, we shall be his people, and God shall be our God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Thank you, Lord, for the former things are passed away. What a place God has for us. If we think this is something, what's coming? It's hard to believe, but it's true. God is life. We have a living God. We have a living Savior. My life is in you, Lord. I've asked our worship team to lead us in that song, so we'll ask them to come at this time. and so We'll sing together, My life is in you, Lord. And then following that, we'll have our song of invitation. And so with a grateful heart, we thank God for the life that we have we didn't just happen. God provided for us to live. <laughs>